<clears throat> okay, and now I'm going to read um, from a work of mine uh, called Melville's Marginalia. And Al suggested I read from the prose introductory section. The whole poem uh, concerns Melville's marginal markings in books. Uh, and particularly, I was interested in his markings in the collected poems of a nearly forgotten Irish poet, James Clarence Mangan. Uh, before I was through with this um, poem, I was, or essay, it was both things, I was convinced that Clarence Mangan uh, was the germ uh, for Bartleby the Scrivener, uh, a story of Wall Street. And I'm sure I'm right, anyway, but. <laughs> Uh, yes, I am. Whoever said that, <laughs> I, I really think I could I could argue with you as to why, but I won't. <laughs> um, anyway, I was struck by uh, <clears throat> the the um, that uh, both authors used uh, were very fond of the Jacobean dramatist Philip Massinger, best known for his play A New Way to Play, to Pay Old Debts. And that's, I knew why they were struck. But anyway, I was also struck by the fact that the, the Massinger, the name Massinger is so close to the word messenger. In fact, looking up Wikipedia the other day, they say that his name is sometimes spelled messenger. Anyway, both Melville and Mangan admired him, and he became a kind of mystery figure. And so I'm going to read um, the epigraph concerning Massinger, and then the last poem in the whole work where Massinger came in at the very beginning. I mean, he came in at the beginning, but he ends the poem. And, and then I'm going to read it first and then move into the preface. So uh, <clears throat> the, the note that Melville had marked was um, March 20, 1639 through 40, buried Philip Massinger, a stranger. Spoke of the hearts of the poor light in which we were rushing. Life is so the merchant either gains the shore both, hand, both hands full of dollars, or else one day waves wash him up on that sandbar, so what? And Massinger smiled, and he said, you know, print settles it. Out of view of the rushing light, print is sentinel, so sages say. Dollars, he said, and hoped they'd have made a bed for him. Then he would call whatever jail a goal. Obedience, we are subject, Susan. Scared millions. And on he rushed. And this is <clears throat> part of the preface. It has an epigraph from Moby Dick. But I have swam through libraries. <laughs> After the critical and public failure of Moby Dick and then Pierre in 1851 through 53, Herman Melville became increasingly isolated from his peers. His life was reading and writing. His friends were the philosophers, poets, dramatists, novelists, historians, biographers, critics, journalists, writers of guidebooks, traps, narratives, memoirs, and letters whose works he read. Melville read with a pencil in his hand. Marks he made in the margins of his books are often a conversation with the dead. During the spring of 1991, I was teaching Billy Budd for a graduate seminar in Philadelphia. One day, while searching through Melville criticism at the Temple University Library, I noticed two maroon dictionary-sized volumes lying haphazardly out of reach almost out of touch on the topmost shelf. That's how I found Melville's marginalia, or Melville's marginalia found me. Wilson, Wilson Walker Cohen, using Merton Seals' checklist, uh, 1948 through 50, as a guide, collected and transcribed every page from every known volume of Herman Melville's library that Melville had marked or annotated. Only the pages Melville <coughs> marked in each book are included, so there is little forward trajectory to whatever novel, narrative, or poem. 
Each marked passage is a literal transcription for the particular edition Melville used. Because Cowan used each original's typeset line lengths, prose often looks like poetry. Texts in the marginalia are alphabetically arranged by an author's name, so authors and writers meet by letter. Cowan submitted this synthesis of attraction and withdrawal to the Department of English in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in the subject of English, Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, June 1965. Scholarly investigators have consulted and are still consulting Melville's marginal notations. The notations and annotations have been marshaled to support one critical reading or another. Wilson Walker Cowan's approach is loving. His informative and detailed introduction shows us why this, this author's marks seem to indicate agreement with what, what he was reading. When Melville disagreed, he argued in the margin. Some marginal notes in Melville's books have been erased by someone. The erasures puzzle Cowan. Much of the erased material concerns Melville's feelings and reactions to women. Cowan does have opinions here. He says that since Melville spent a lifetime thinking about women, even though they seldom appear in his fiction, the misogynist nature of the nearly obliterated markings show the author was much too disturbed by this subject to write about it. Still, before leaving the persistent problem of eradication in the marginal body of his subject matter, Wilson Walker Cowan meditates on the provenance of the corruption. Elizabeth Shaw Melville is probably the culprit. She is the perpetrator with the racer. There is no question but that she examined at least some of her husband's books, this is his quote, and possessed the opportunity after his death to alter them if she wished. Her scrupulosity in signing her own annotations does not eliminate the possibility that she may have done some other editing. Indeed, it may be an effort to disguise her part in actions of that sort, unquote. Cowan is bound to admit some of the rubbing out seems to have been done hastily by a person unfamiliar with Melville's methods of annotation. Quote, if the books were erased by later hands, it appears more likely to have been Melville's daughters, Elizabeth and Frances, than Mrs. Osborne and Mrs. Metcalf, who have generously made Melville's library available to scholars, unquote. Margins speak of fringes of consciousness or marginal associations. What is the shadow reflex of art? I am in the margins of doubt. In 1987, as if to emphasize the difference between dissertations and books, or between graduate students and professors, the title page of Melville's Marginalia reads, Harvard Dissertations in American and English Literature, edited by Stephen Orgel, Stanford University, a Garland series. Wilson Walker Cowan's name and the name of his work follow on page two. The extracts in Melville's Marginalia were collected, transcribed, and collated by a dedicated sub-subgraduate student in a time before librarians, scholars, and authors relied on computers or Xerox machines. Perhaps his Leviathan dissertation exhausted him. The copyright page of the Garland edition lists Melville's dates, 1819 through 91, and the dates of Cowan, 1934 through 87. Mrs. Wilson Walker Cowan holds the copyright to his recently resurrected body of work. Stephen Orgel's edited reprint is currently out of print. Wilson Walker Cowan was a borrower whose commentator I am. Sometimes I wonder if Mrs. Wilson Walker Cowan is Wilson Walker's widow or his mother. Names who are strangers out of bounds of the bound margin. I thought one way to write about, about a loved author would be to follow what trails he follows through words of others. 
What if these pencil, single, double, and triple scorings, arrows, short phrases, angry outbursts, crosses, cryptic ciphers, sudden enthusiasms, mysterious erasures, have come to find you too, here again, now? Round about the margin or edge of anything in a way that is close to the limit. A narrow margin, slightly. If water is margined imagined by the tender grass, marginal, belonging to the brink or margent, the brink or brim of anything, from telepathy to poetry, a marginal growth of willow and water flag, a feather on the edge of a bird's wing, August 1992.